Good morning, and welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Katie Arrington. Please welcome INSA Executive Vice President, John Doyen. Good morning, and thank you for your patience, and also thank you for joining us today for Coffee and Conversation. We're pleased to host Katie Arrington, one of our community's top leaders. Before we begin, let me make a few housekeeping notes. First, we hope to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions for us, please use the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. There are nearly 500 people registered today, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Secondly, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. As a reminder, this program is on the record. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, BAE Systems, for their critical support of this program. We simply could not deliver this kind of premier thought leadership without the support from our partners. And I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Jeffrey Dodson, who is Chief Security Officer for BAE Systems, who will introduce our speaker. JC, over to you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's our pleasure to be sponsoring this event with INSA. Uh, BA has been a founding member since its beginning nearly 16 years ago and, and couldn't be prouder of the accomplishments of uh, the staff of INSA and the membership. Uh, this is a particularly interesting topic and we're very pleased to bring in Katie Arrington today uh, with John and understand the ins and outs of CMMC, which is occurring and, and being implemented by the department. Uh, Katie and I have worked together nearly three, four years now on this effort. She has been a, a colleague of industries in terms of her transparency, and I don't think you'll find anybody with more compassion and empathy for industry, as well as a drive to secure our uh, supply chains. So with that, John, it's a pleasure. Thank you for allowing BAE to sponsor this event, and uh, let's hear what Haiti has to say. Good morning, and I am so sorry for my tardiness. This is one of those moments in the Pentagon you just can't make up. They they booked up the whole studio, and there was no place for me to go. So I apologize to everybody on the call. Um, you're very, very important. Um, so I will get right into it, John. Um, uh, do you want to uh, roll out some questions, or you want me to jump off from uh, 30,000 feet? Well, how about a little of both? First, let me just also extend my welcome to you, Katie, and we're glad you're here. And we certainly, uh, we're all flexible and uh, agile and uh, roll with the punches. So we're, we're started and that's a great thing. And um, I know that as DOD CISO for acquisition, there's a lot on your plate. And so um, if you could tell us, start off with your current priorities and challenges uh, as we look ahead um, and uh, get the conversation started there. So first and foremost, we, you know, we're, we're all living in interesting times. And to let everyone know, the CMMC is going to continue. We are not stopping. We haven't let up on the, the gas on this one. Um, we are rapidly rolling through a mere, I think, 17 days until the interim rule um, becomes effective. So know that everybody out there um, listening today, the CMMC uh, and the, the DFAR rule change, which is the current rule is DFAR rule 252.204.7012 is morphing, <laughs> like that's my word of the week, into three new uh, DFAR rules. And they end in 7019, 7020, 7021. And the most important to everybody on the call today um, is that the 7019 is required of all vendors with new work, and I really want to highlight that, new work, um, to go into SPURS, the Supplier's Risk Management System, and uh, do a record a self-assessment on where they think they are based on the DOD methodology, which is at the same um, location at the supplier risk, um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the SPURS uh, platform. Um, every vendor will be required to record um, their and file it with their cage code, the program number, et cetera. That needs to be done before contract award after December 1st. So everybody should be going and logging in and taking their self-assessment. Um, I've been talking about this for almost two years. Um, we are the crawl, the walk, the run. The 7012 clause, the DFAR clause back in 2015, um, 
that has been, you know, that trust that everybody was doing or, or moving to, uh, had a poem to um, actually do the 110 controls of the NIST, um, National Institute of Standard and Technology, um, uh, special publication 800-171. Um, it's Trust But Verify. So this is going to be the, the start of a new day in the Department of Defense where cybersecurity, as we have been saying for you know, two years, is foundational to all acquisition. We're putting our, 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 our money where our, our what is it? Money where your mouth is, or I can't remember the acronym. Um, but we're we mean it, and we we're doing this because it is so critical to our, the U.S. Uh, commerce, um, the, our national security. So, as of December one, we're rolling, and as soon as the rule change, uh, the interim rule goes final, um, we are getting ready to release the names uh, of the pilot programs that we'll be launching in 2021. Those 15 contracts and uh, more to follow. Uh, we have five years to roll the CMMC out, but we are moving forward. And let's get into the Q&A side of the world. Okay. Well, I do have a couple of questions that have come in and we'll, let's start with the rollout. So we're going to start phase, I guess it's phases, right? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the first phase will be getting here in a few weeks. Um, can you give us the, the view of how you see um, the rollout moving forward and what we can expect? So we have 15 contracts uh, in uh, uh, year calendar year 21. I'm sorry, fiscal year 21. So we have uh, 15 contracts. Um, we have about three from each service. Uh, we have several. We have one, two from DLA, uh, uh, MDA, uh, Mitchell Defense Agency. We have Transcom, um, DLA. I mentioned. I'm sorry. And all the services, and I believe one from Cybercom as well, uh, they're varying in size. Uh, we wanted to do some, uh, you know, very easy ones, um, some very complicated ones, uh, but all of them have a different prime. So we have uh, 15 different primes across uh, the Department of Defense and, and our partner agencies. And each one of those, we're, we're going with the assumption, has 150 new organic um, subcontractors. So what we mean by that is there would be, you know, for every prime, there's 150 subs. So we're estimating we're going to get 1,500 companies certified CMMC in uh, 21. And we're going to be doing this in phases. So... For 1,500 to, to seven, uh, 1,750 in year one, if you include the primes, um, roll up, and then we'll continue to build on top of that. It will take us five years first to get the amount of um, certified uh, assessors to go in and perform the audits and to get through all the acquisitions. Uh, but we are, it's definitely going to be a, a, a flavoring of uh, sole source. There'll be some uh, in there. There'll be uh, IDIQs. And, and we already know GSA is leaned in with the STARS uh, vehicle. So we're rocking and rolling. Okay. If you're a, if you're a, happen to be on this first year, if you're a, say a small company that mm -hmm. is not one of those uh, 150 times 15 uh, uh, subs. <laughs> um, uh, are you know how can you are are you still able to you know bid on contracts and things? When does the when do the requirements become firm that that um, uh, this is mandated when a company has to have a CMMC certification before they can can do work? So John, that's a great question. There's been so much conversation about this. During calendar year 21, there'll only be 15 um, contracts, and we'll make that very clear in the next week or so. We're going to put that out, and everyone will know who is on, you know, who at least in the community of interest. Um, we are not stopping a company um, from getting and, and requesting a CMMC a certified assessor from coming and getting their certification in FY21. We're just saying that these are the contracts we're working with, the, um, as this has always been, a crawl, walk, run. So if you're not in those 15 contracts um, in year one, you, you know, you, you're not involved in, in, in the mandatory you've got to get to it. But we highly recommend you get uh, your certification lined up because uh, in the course of 
five years, it, the new bids, you have to consider that we're going to roll out, um, you know, every year we're bringing out new contracts. So you have to look at it in your P win, right? Your, your potential or percentage of win and your BMP, your, your bid and proposal. So if you're bidding on work that is going to be, uh, you know, you think coming online in the end of 21 um, and you, you're working towards that, I would work towards whatever um, level you are currently doing right now. So if you have that DFAR clause in your contract, right, the, mm -hmm. the 7012 clause in your contract, and you're executing, you have already attested to the government, you're doing that 110 controls. So you need to get to the point, you know, we've given the models out publicly, we've had them out there since January of 2020. You can go to the CMMC website, you can download the model, you can look at what is required to do the controls and processes in each level of maturity, and you should be assessing yourself as where you are right now. So if it's you're not one of the 15 uh, pro, the contracts, right, doesn't mean that you shouldn't go get it. It's just saying that these are the ones that we're going to require prior to contract award um, to have, the, I'm sorry, at the time of award, have their CMMC certification. But there's no time like the present. The sooner that you're 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 secure, the better your company is. And we're hoping that this is you know the the wake up to get companies to actually do the 110 controls of the NIST 171. Um, so if you're not on those 15, you still if you're aside from that, if you're not on the 15, but you are getting new work in FY 21 after December 1st, you are going to need to register your own assessment of your company in SPURS, the supplier risk um, uh, platform. Okay, um, we have a question here um, that asks about competition. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, how does, you know, how is DOD intending to control uh, um, or, you know, to make sure that CMMC in some way doesn't stifle competition, you know, as, as companies uh, work to get new contracts, um, and uh, um, you know, how can they continue to be competitive? So we really took a lot of, of thought and, and care. Now, uh, JC, who I, you know, I'm privileged to work with, but you know, also call him a friend. He's a good man um, and doing wonderful things for, for BAE. Uh, when we first started this, right, we, in industry, and remember, I came from industry. That's like my birthplace. It right now isn't, uh, it is not equal. It's not fair competition right now for a small business, specifically a small business. So if you're a small business and you have that DFAR clause in your contract and you're um, only doing 80 of the controls and you have a plan um, to which it should have been executed on if you started work since 2015, but um, you have a plan to get to implement the 110 controls and it's gonna be two years down the line. Um, which, which you shouldn't be at this point, but using that as the example, your rate would be, uh, and I'm just throwing out a number, 150 an hour, right? But you're attesting on the, the, the contract that you are technically acceptable. That's all we're asking right now is, can, uh, do, are you aware of the 171 and are you implementing and what is your plan? Company B is bidding on the same work. You, but company B is doing 110 controls of the NIST 171. Both companies are a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. They both have the similar CPAR um, ratings. They're both, you know, they have the same technical type bench. They have the same type of resumes to comprise their team, right? You go to the contract award, right? Does the Contracting officers see a difference in technical capability? No, because they're both attesting. Now, one rate is higher and one rate is lower. Company A's rate is lower because they're not doing everything they should be doing, so therefore their rates do not show it. Company B is and their rate is higher. Well, who's going to get the work? Well, we all know it's, it's a hard pill to swallow, but LPTA. What's going to happen with the CMMC is, A, it's going to be a go no go decision. So when the CMMC assessor comes and does the audit, you either are level one or you're not. 
you either are level two or you're not. You either are level three or you're not, and up the chain. So it will be equal for all, and it will not be used as a source selection factor. That's, I couldn't, that was one of the big things in DOD. If I made it a source selection factor, right, that wouldn't be fair. We, we, it needed to be a go, no go decision because it would be arbitrary. It wouldn't be defendable. We needed a third party audit like ISO. You know, you can equal, we know there's a ISO clause for cybersecurity, but I would really for industry to look at as you look at an ISO certification, like ISO 9000, we put it in the contract, right? It's not that you're, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm sort of ISO certified. It's a go, no go decision. That's exactly what we're doing with the CMMC. It's a, a if you, starting August, December 1st on contracts, if you're not, um, have your assessment uh, logged in SPURS, we cannot award the contract thing one. The CMMC, it'll be what the requirement is in the contract. Now, that's one of the big discussion points, right, that we, I wanted, and, and not me, the PMO shop and, and all of us that worked on the, the whole working groups, the CMMC AB, we want companies to define their own destiny. We want small businesses to, to build into maturity, and we want them to continue to grow. So we we created a maturity model. You know that's what it's based upon. You, you get better. You you learn critical thinking around cybersecurity, and you keep layering on top of it. What you'll see in the pilots as they roll out is that it will say in the contracts. You know, unless otherwise stated, that every vendor on this contract will need CMMC level one. So the de facto for industry is level one certification. Because security is not one size fits all. That's what we've been saying this entire time. Um, and know that because we're saying the security is an allowable cost and we want you to build the cost of the CMMC into your rates to, to build it in, you have to understand what the, the level of security that you need for that particular program. So you may see... Um, RF, RFIs and, and RFPs that say the prime needs to have CMMC level three. And then in sections L and sections M, I'm sorry, C and, and L, you'll see the contractor shall, and then they'll call the requirement out. And if it doesn't need level three certification, it'll say CMMC level one. Because what we want to do is make sure that, um, you know, we're still doing the small business, um, you know, requirements in all contracts that we already have. We are still ensuring that we, we give the small businesses the opportunity and in fair and open competition to stay partnered and working with their, their primes. So it's know that it's. it's built on maturity. It's built on tailoring in the right security for the program and the work that we're trying to, to uh, cover down on, on the CMMC and the DFAR rules. Okay. Hey, let's go um, move to some of the questions that are coming in. One is uh, from Tyler Williams with Lockheed Martin, who asked, how will industry verify that a contractor has the correct CMMC level required to receive award? So first, um, that Tyler, great question. And I have, uh, we are, I have my my thoughts on this, and the primes, um, it, we're working this out with the spurs, right? The prime needs to know and ensure. So initially, I firmly believe it needs to be in an NDA, that, that, that as you're working in a teaming agreement, you should open that discussion up to your prime. Where you are, if you're not, you know, you're doing the self-assessments and you're like, gee, I, I'm... I'm a, a CMMC level two. I really want to get to three for the current work. I think that's where I need to be. Here's my plan to get there. And working with their prime on the, the bid and proposal, right? That's the whole point of this is upping your P-win capability. Um, right now, it's N, doing an NDA. Um, we're trying to work through the, the, the large, like Lockheed, have supply chain um, links in Oasis and whatnot to check. My, my one concern, Tyler, and to everyone on the call, right, our adversaries, do we make it easier for them, 
right? So if companies put it out on their marketing collateral and they put it out on their website and you're only CMMC certified level one, right? We're telling everyone in, in the, the, the world what you're not doing, what you're certified not doing. So it's one of those things that I don't, you know, I don't need to make it any easier for the adversary to exfil. Uh, but I, I do want to maintain the, the, the level of competition and, and making sure that there is informed. So as we start um, NDA uh, with, you know, the sub to prime and make sure that there's continuity of information, um, we're working through, uh, we'll be uh, storing the repository of the accreditation, the certified um, audits on EMAS. And we're working a way that primes can check um, levels as they go to uh, put RFPs in. So we're working on that path um, because this is a new program, um, making sure that all the, the internet of things is working uh, to ensure that. Okay. Um, we also have a question from Catherine Mills, who's out actually with the UC Boulder uh, out in Colorado. And she asked, when can we expect the release of the allowable cost for CMMC certification? So uh, they actually are already in the DFAR rule. So if you go through the DFAR rule um, and, and in the, the, you know, in uh, 7021 and in 7019, um, we rolled in um, cost assessments. Um, for doing the, the SPURS self-assessment, we even put that in there. Um, on the level, the the DFAR rule 7012, if you go to the Federal Register, you go into the 7012 clause, you go in and you read through to you get to the 7021 clause. In that, you'll see um, the cost allowable, you know, uh, per man hour, how long it should take, and the cost of the certification itself that the, the what we're estimating, the uh, CMMC assessor coming in and doing that work. We've also put into that rate how long it would take a company or a university to get prepared for the audit. We have included in that the 20 additional controls on level three and the cost of doing level four and level five. We have assumed the um, rate for initial certification and then how much a year to maintain and then the three year, you know, every three years you have to get recertified with the CMMC. What we're not, did not put in that rate structure is the 110 controls of the NIST because by statute, companies are already attesting they're doing it. They're checking that 7012 box and saying, yes, we are. So I can't build a cost in to something you're already in your rates. So no, that's the delta. But we've made it very clear in the rule the allowable co what we estimate the allowable cost. Okay. Hey, we're getting a couple of questions in about uh, handling uh, CUI uh, mm -hmm. control unclassified information, um, and I'll read them. You know, do all contractors need to enter a self-assessment uh, in SBRS, or only those who handle? Uh, CUI and, and similarly, do contractors who do not handle CUI need to enter in self-assessment? So I guess both both ways to look at that. That's from uh, Glenda Snodgrass. So Glenda, um, first things, security, cybersecurity is now in all acquisitions. So December first, if you're looking for a contract award and it is not a micro purchase less than ten thousand, and it is it's not it does not apply to COPS. So otherwise than that, the CUI is off the table in the fact that everyone needs to do their register in SPURS, their self-assessment. When, when you are handling CUI um, or uh, federally, federally controlled, uh, sorry, FCI, FDI, I can never um, get that acronym right. If you are handling CUI, Right, and the DOD has a new in, uh, updated instruction. There's a website, DOD CUI dot, and I want to say it's mil or dot gov. I'll go back and check right now. We've created a desk guide for companies to look and to understand what CUI is. We have um, a tremendous amount of uh, education on this. If you go to that website, um, then if you go to projectspectrum.ic. 
That's projectspectrum.ic. Um, I O. I'm sorry. Um, they also have under resources a CUI guide. So know that we, you know, when we made the the big change to say that cybersecurity is foundational to all acquisition, um, we not only had to train and help get industry aware of that, we had to internally into the government realize that, right? So we have something called the Adaptive Acquisition Framework. It is the, um, the, the, the reform of the 5000, the DOD Instruction 5000, which is the guide for which program managers create um, their acquisition plan. One of the core tenets of the Adaptive Acquisition Framework is that cybersecurity is in all acquisitions now. So we have a new um, instruction. It's called 5000.CS, Cybersecurity. And that is giving the guide to the PMs to critically think about the cybersecurity requirements on their contract. It helps the PM uh, the instruction on how they break down CUI and how they look at it in the contracting, you know, in the mechanism that they contract with. So making it very clear that the prime is responsible for handling the, the CUI from the government and only the companies that they're going to be sending that CUI down are ones that will need to get beyond the CMMC level one because we really need to get, you know, one of the three things that is the most impactful and costing us the most resource loss, that means, you know, IP, uh, data rights loss, uh, you know, straight up cyber espionage, ransomware, three core tenants. People are not changing their passwords. They are not implementing two-factor authentication, and they are not marking documents appropriately, and we are, we are burdening and causing harm to our supply chain by those three factors. So the CUI is, you know, it's regardless on the new rule, the 7012 rule, so everyone with the exception of micro-purchases and the COTS products. What does that mean? Excluding COTS. So if you are selling Microsoft Office as a, a subscription to the government, we are not asking for Microsoft to get certified. We are asking for you, the, pers the, the company selling it, that if CUI isn't transversing your company, then you all only need a CMMC level one. And in the self-assessment, you're probably going to be in the basic category. You're, you're not going to be doing all the 110 controls of the NIST because you weren't required to. So everybody's required after December 1st, self-assessment in SPURS. Okay. Hey, here's a question from um, Douglas Hartman with Red Hat. And he wants to know what is being done to secure the software supply from foreign vendors like Rancher Sousa or Alibaba. I, I get. I'm. I'm sorry. I didn't. It's Red Hat and how to secure software. Um, what is it? Purchases from right. Alibaba. He says, "What is being done to secure the software being supplied from foreign vendors such as uh, Rancher Sousa or Alibaba?" Oh, so we I, we're absolutely. You know, here in, when we go to do. Um, an award. We do have a database that we we check into. We look at Miss um, Lord. Um, you know, a we have export control, so we're not sending anything out that we don't want to send out. As far as buying product or bringing it in, um, there that's a whole evolution of supply chain risk management that really is becoming the the it thing. Um, the CMMC is more about a company's critical thinking and maturity about how they position themselves for cybersecurity. When it comes to actually purchasing software, um, Ms. Lord, the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment, um, has the unique authority um, by U.S. Code um, 41, uh, Section 2339 Alpha. When the CIO and the um, Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment agree that a product, that a software product causes harm to the NSS, the national security systems, they can actually in, in put on a 2339 alpha, which then gets logged into our spurs um, and we will not purchase uh, nefarious product. 
that way. Um, another way that's coming along is something I'm the DOD representative on the Federal Acquisition Security Council. And what we're doing as as a a federal community, we have a council that meets uh, monthly. We have a, a actual workforce, uh, the the task force working group, and we are going through and evaluating software products on the whole to see if they present any inherent risk to federal um, agencies and their networks and enterprises. Um, those uh, that. DFAR rule went into play uh, about a month ago. It went um, it went in term to final rule. So we are working to get that out of um, any nefarious product out of the uh, infrastructure. Um, 889B, if you all were following it this past fall, uh, this past summer, I'm sorry, that was the federal government um, in, in from NDAA 2018, um, Section 889 of the NDAA, uh, we had to, in the government, um, remove Huawei, Dawei, Hike Vision uh, video surveillance cameras, equipment, and uh, move them out of our telecoms. In this past year, uh, it, what is known as 889B, is we had to have ensure that our contractors did not have those products in their networks or enterprises. And they currently have to make that a, a, a testament and assertion on SAM's registration. So we're doing our best um, to buy down the risk. But I think that, you know, the, the environment that we really need to look at is a zero trust environment um, moving forward, uh, you know, over the, the next few years, really baking in DevSecOps or um, DevOps into our software development. I think a software bill of lading is a great idea. I just don't know um, the the how much you know, resource we have in the DOD to to review it, to keep the repositories on it, and to, you know, do the auditing. But as we're looking to um, these supply chain illumination tools where we can highlight, you know, vendors that are using a particular software um, in their package suites that they, they provide to the government, um, we're, we're moving light years in the uh, capability to be able to see that. Um, we really need to look as a nation, but in, in industry, risk mitigation um, around uh, software or capability that may be harmful to your network or to uh, the national uh, defense. So uh, there's a lot going on with that, but that's you know some of the things that we're doing to get nefarious products out. Well, I literally have at least 20 more questions here, but I know we're running, we are running out of time. Um, so um, let me perhaps a pause here and say, uh, give the give you the mic back and, and with the question, um, do you have any closing comments uh, or uh, things that you'd like to, to um, really press upon us about CMMC or any other uh, related issues? So, um, and I appreciate that. And once again, I apologize to everyone on this call. I, I, not to be disrespectful of your time. I'm so sorry for the confusion this morning and that I cost you 10 minutes of your life that, you know, hope you enjoyed the music. Um, my, my pressing statement out is we are not slowing down. The adversary is not waiting. China, Russia, North Korea, Iran are not taking a pause. They are working every day to, to exfil and, and, you know, negatively affect our supply chain. Um, I, I say this, um, we are all in this together. Um, we need our supply chains to be aware that risk that is out there. The CMMC, the, the, the SPURS registration, the self-assessment, it's to help you critically think about your posture for cybersecurity. Um, this isn't going to go away. Um, this is happening. Um, the default rule goes into effect December 1st. That means it's real and it's happening. So anything that we can do to help, we're, we're, I've tried to be as collaborative and, and communicative as possible with industry. That will continue. We are not going to stop any of that. But please take in, into care and into consideration. Um, cybersecurity is that thing that links us all together, that, that, that commonality. And I'm only as good as you are and how you're prepared. Um, so uh, my, my parting words to you and, and to everyone on the call, um, please uh, test negative, stay positive, 
be kind, and know that we're all in this together. Thank you, for the, the John, for your patience with me this morning, and JC, um, BAE, thank you guys very much. I so appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, and I'll say, yes, it is real, and I know it is happening next month, uh, but more importantly, it's really needed. It's something that we, we need to bake in cybersecurity, uh, and um, you know, as we implement this, uh, we thank you for the work you've done reaching out to industry to really build that partnership and having that discussion with your industry partners, and we're pleased to be a, a small part of that today. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for being late. I hope you have a wonderful day, John. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. I really appreciate your candid insights. And for everyone who's been able to join us online today, thank you for joining us. Uh, and once again, thank you to BAE Systems for their support of this program. I do want to have uh, a few uh, words to say about upcoming uh, INSA events. Uh, next week on November 17th, we'll host our annual speed mentoring program. And the kickoff uh, will be provided by Colonel Candace Frost. Uh, and then our somewhat like 150 mentees will break out into virtual breakout rooms with mentors, uh, which should really be an inspiring event. Uh, the following day on 18 November, we'll host Dustin Gard Weiss, who's the Deputy Director of uh, Intelligence for Policy and Capabilities uh, at ODNI, and he'll be discussing intelligence community priorities in the way ahead. Um, we'll take a break for Thanksgiving week, but we'll be right back afterwards, and on December the 1st, in partnership with the Cyber Solarium Commission, we'll host a program focused on the future of the national security cyber workforce. We're pleased that Chris Inglis, who was one of the commissioners on the Solarium, Cyber Solarium, uh, will be providing a keynote. And some of the other uh, panelists include FBI's Deputy Assistant Director for Cyber Readiness and Outreach Intelligence, Tanya Ergowitz, and Teresa Shea from Raytheon. Uh, on December 2nd, John Beeler from ODNI, who's the Director of Science and Technology, will be talking about intelligence community priorities for industry and, and research and development. And then the following week on the 9th of December, we look forward to our leadership luncheon with the new uh, Director of the Joint uh, AI Center, Lieutenant General Michael Grohn. Uh, you can find out more about all of these events and register at our website, and we hope you'll take a look there. Also, uh, once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, when the webinar ends, there'll be a short survey, uh, two or three questions. Um, please take a few moments to complete it and let us know how we did. And that's all for today. Stay safe and healthy, and hope everyone has a great day.